All right, welcome to Getting Paid. That's just a shameless plug. Uh, working with Ethereum and Micronaut and Grails. My name is uh, Ryan Vandewerf. I work for OCI on the Grails and Micronaut team. I like to tinker with gadgets, cars, beer, winemaking. So if you don't like my talk, we can talk about any of those things afterwards. And if you need any help with the Groovy Grails or Micronaut support, uh, give us a call. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? What is blockchain? We're going to talk about different kinds of blockchains, the Ethereum concepts and terms. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to show you how to set up your own private network uh, locally on your machine and how to work with it. Uh, I'm going to show you what smart contracts are, show you some of the... Uh, smart contract languages and DSLs. I've got a Grails example. Uh, we'll mine some money and um, transfer some money between accounts, and we can deploy a smart contract. And we can try to update one, too. Can't guarantee that one will work. And we also got a Micronaut example. We're going to do all the same things. So uh, I've got two boilerplate templates to get started working with Ethereum. All right. So let's talk about what is blockchain. There's always a lot of buzz around all this stuff, right? What does all this really mean? What do I care? Um, you know, it, it is in some ways so overhyped at this point. It's like a solution looking for a problem, but um, still it's good to have a good overview of doing this uh, and what's all involved and what the terminology is because people throw these words around a lot. So blockchain is really just a distributed lever ledger of transactions and it goes between parties and it basically has a uh, consensus among all the parties that um, uh, all the data in the chain is true. So it's the whole collective of everything that makes it so. Um, and that includes terminology, technology like smart contracts too, right? So you're not only a transaction, but you could have a contract that could run some bit of code and do something. So blockchain is really this sort of incorruptible digital letter. Uh, everything's encrypted. It's all distributed. Um, and it's all economic transactions and all those things. Um, uh, but it can't, you know, it can be more than just financial transactions, but really sort of tracking anything of value. So here's a top blockchain platform. So I'm going to talk about one today, and that just happens to have decent Java support. Some of them don't really have any Java support or something you would use in the JVM. So um, uh, the most popular one is e uh, EOS on the public side, uh, Ethereum, GX Chain, Komodo, Ontology, Nulls, Nebulas, Neos. And so these are an index that's published every few months um, by, by some branch of the Chinese government ranks these. And so those are the top ones. There's like thousands of them almost at this point. But they kind of move, they change places a lot too. So Ethereum's pretty close up to the top. That's a good one to talk about. Hmm? Uh, number of uh, transactions and, and value transferred through it. Because you have to make smart contracts for each one of those platforms, you really want to, people are always trying to target what's the top five, because it's too much effort to do all of those other ones too, right? All right, let's talk about vocabulary, because this is the most confusing part when someone's talking about blockchain things, is what do all these words mean? Uh, you hear something called gas thrown around, and gas is like the pricing value uh, that's required to conduct a transaction, right? So when people are running miners, what they're really doing is uh, they're you know, getting paid with gas to, by someone else who wants a transaction executed or a, a smart contract. Uh, deployed. So someone else will pick that up using their computing power, and the cost is called cost in gas. Um, another term that's common when you work with this stuff is called uh, way, and that's really the tiniest denomination of ether. So, um, you know, one, e one e ether is, is, you know, like a billion way. And then there's something called a gas limit, right? So um, you can deploy transactions or smart contracts, and you can set a gas limit on it to avoid overpaying. Uh, for whatever reason, the network's really busy, and maybe it costs too much to process the transaction at the moment. Uh, you can set this gas limit, and that means that uh, you, you've lowered your cost. Uh, you're going to wait, right, until um, 
you have, you have a, you know, what, what amount of gas you want to spend to process it is. And then something called GUE, and that's really the denomination of ether uh, that we're talk about when we're working with the actual Ethereum um, system. So one ether equal to a billion GUE. So it's uh, very small fractional amounts, right, you're working with here. So when you want something done, you might get, you know, uh, 500 way or something for it, and that's like not even so such a fractional amount, right? Uh, when we talk about a wallet or a smart wallet, so that's sort of the gateway um, to decentralized applications on the Ethereum blockchain, and it allows you to hold and secure Ether and other crypto assets uh, built on Ethereum, as well as you can write, deploy, and use some smart contracts uh, through, through a smart wallet. And then the ether base, people talk about what an e what's an ether base, that's like the first account in your key store. So when you, if you, you fire up your own chain, um, that's going to be the base one. All right, so there's sort of a schema that it follows when we're talking about blockchain here. Um, these are the blocks. They have block headers. They have, um, you know, a hash value pointing to the previous block. And that's what makes it a chain, right? So each one can point backwards and it goes, keeps going and going. And so what will eventually happen is the chain will get too long, and then they call it a fork, and they'll make another chain. And that's when you hear people on the news saying, oh, Ethereum forked, because um, they do that for many reasons. Sometimes it's too long, or there's some kind of bug or security hole uh, that people are using, exploiting to steal money. So sometimes they'll fork it and, uh, to, with the fix on the other one. So that way uh, they can kind of control it. So this is what a, a blockchain entry looks like. Uh, this is a cool little thing called ethviewer.live. And so you can see on the public Ethereum blockchain what's happening uh, right now. So we can see this is the blockchain going, right? These are all the transactions going from and to. And you can see all this stuff out here of how much money has been transacted. And so some of them are so fractional you can't see anything. So this is really what's happening in real time. Uh, it's a pretty interesting thing. And so we can dive in and look at any one of these and see, okay, what's going on with this guy? So someone mined this transaction. Um, there's a difficulty ranking and all these things that, uh, this is how much gas was used. So this was like 8 million um, uh, GUE. So um, that was, you know, not a ton of money, but someone paid for it. And this was a transaction of 268.99. So this is, uh, it's pretty interesting to see how all of this works. And so nothing really is anonymous, right? When you look at any one of these, you can see that uh, who, who did the transaction. But so as long as someone wants to be anonymous, they just have to make sure that their public key isn't tracked back to the person if they want to be anonymous, right? So if you use a common um, uh, exchange to get currency, what can happen is uh, they need 10 forms of ID and all these different things. And so when you've got those keys in there, now there's like a way for them to find you. So uh, it's not really necessarily as anonymous as you, as you might think. Um, again, it depends on how you get into the system. All right, let's move on. So what is the primary purpose of all this stuff, really? And the, and the whole point of it initially was just to facilitate payment between two parties without a middleman, right? No bank. You don't have to pay the bank. Everyone's paying each other. And so, you know, what, what are the reasons that make this so appealing? And that's really this, it's anonymous, it's decentralized, uh, everything's encrypted, and it's all peer-to-peer. -peer. So if somebody wants to destroy the entire network, it would be very difficult. They would have to take out most of the internet to do that. Versus uh, if a bank is based in a certain country and there's some sort of turmoil that could shut it down, then you could lose everything. So <coughs> that's really appealing to a lot of people. So let's talk about what these things mean. What is really a distributed letter, uh, ledger? And that's just this consensus of replicated, shared, and synchronized uh, data that's geographically spread across multiple sites, countries, or institutions. So there really is no central administrator um, 
as far as the centralized data storage. So there's, again, there's no one place that takes the whole thing out. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer really, you know, obviously is um, just make sure that everything's done and replicated across nodes. Um, and that's really important for a distributed uh, ledger in a blockchain system. And when the di distributed ledger is uh, spread across a bunch of nodes uh, and some sort of peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, it replicates and saves identical copy of the ledger and updates itself independently. So that means everyone starts gathering all of the information of the whole thing so that if any one place is gone, that data isn't gone because it's in a zillion other places. As long as you have people that keep running miners on the system. So uh, once the consensus is taken, and that's the algorithm of different blockchain systems that says, you know, we have consensus, that means that, not, that now is a matter of record. And that's, uh, at that point, is not really changeable. All right. Uh, another thing we talk about was, is anonymous, right? Everyone always says, oh, Bitcoin or, you know, these technologies are anonymous. And, uh, you know, ideally they can be. Um, you know, that you really is just everyone has that address, right? It's f that's their sort of public key. So um, you need to find a way to link that up. And so governments have been starting to try to regulate blockchain by saying, you need to register with us so we know who you are. And so if you're doing illegal activities with this, we can, you know, find you. So there's some ways around this if you really want to be anonymous and you're paranoid. Um, you could use a crypto ATM where you're actually exchanging like cash. Uh, for and then you put your key in, and that way there, there's no way to do that. There's another place called Wall of Coins, another one called Shapeshift, and there's a few others uh, that allow you to really stay anonymous. A lot of other places, if they're in some uh, locality of a government, they may, you know, the possibility they could raid the place and then try to find out who you are or get a court order or things like that. But there's a lot of people who have done this and stayed anonymous because there's a lot of stolen money that's been marked as stolen on these blockchains, and they're just waiting for the right person to try to grab it and take it out, but they just watch it, you know. There's millions and millions of dollars marked as stolen, and they're just waiting to try to catch the person that tries to take the money out. All right, so when we encrypt everything, why do we do that? So Ethereum uses this elliptical curved uh, digital signature algorithm uh, for its public key cryptography. Uh, that's the same as Bitcoin. So um, the reason I do this, it's the smaller key sizes than the RSA stuff, uh, but it's equivalent in security. So it's just less data you have to pass around. So uh, do you have to use real money to play with this stuff? And the answer is no. Um, you can run this stuff on your own machine, create your own little private blockchain, uh, do all the same things with an application, but then you're not actually investing any real money in it. As long as you're supplying computing power to run miners, it doesn't matter. You don't have to pay. So what you do is you create your own network ID with Ethereum, and I'll show you that in an example. So we can bootstrap up our own local blockchain, set a network ID. There's one network ID that's reserved for the public one. Uh, you can also use another uh, private blockchain stack, uh, one called Hyperledger Fabric is a really popular one people use for trying to make applications in a private type of setting. And really that just, uh, at that point, you're probably just wanting to use these things called dApps uh, for uh, the, your own purposes, and you don't want to have to pay to have them processed on the public network, right? If you don't have any need for that decentralization, and that's not a concern, well, A, then why are you using blockchain? But uh, if you do because someone thought it was a cool idea at your company, um, you know, you don't want to have to pay every time someone runs the dApp or, cert, you know, processes a transaction of some sort, so... That's why you would do it privately. All right, so uh, let's take a look at here. I've got and here's how we run everything. I'm running a tool called Geth. It's called G-E-T-H. And so what, what's going on right here on this screen is I've got a miner running. So I actually have a console and I run Geth and I initialize it and I say uh, create new accounts and things like that, and then I can turn my miner on. So if I say miner.stop, I'm gonna, oh, that's a cool, 
cool return message there it gives you, but that means it stops, right? Now I have nothing processing a transaction. So if I want to go into a Grails app and transfer some money, it's just going to sit here because no one's, there's no one on the network to process my data, you know, to collect that money. And uh, when, I'm when I have my miner turned on, I can go to my Ethereum wallet. And this is called, it's just called Ethereum wallet. You can download it. I'll have links to the stuff at the end. Um, so I've got created two accounts. You always get, start with Etherbase. Again, that's your kind of root account of, your, of the chain. And when you fire up your miner, by default, it goes to that. So I was, I've been mining this all afternoon. So I've gotten, um, you know, 30,000 Ether. And then I can transfer to this second account. I can just make one, right? All I do to add an account is just go in here and say, okay, put a password in, and then it's going to create a, a new key for that person. So now this person account two is identified by this value here. So if I want to transfer money, uh, I can do it in a Grails app and Micronaut app. So let's go to that. I'll start with the Grails one. Let's start with the Micronaut one, because Grails takes a while to start. All right. All right, so I've made a simple app here, and I just say, okay, I want to send some money. And I'll show you the code for this in a second. But so I'm going to go in here and take this, um, go to my wallet. Cut and paste this address. I say I want to send some some money to account two, my originally named thing. And how much am I going to send? Well, <laughs> that's like ten ether. <laughs> that's a really large number. It, it looks like a lot, but as you can see, uh, I'll go ahead and submit this transaction, and it's going to wait. Nothing's going to happen. Oh wait. What's happening? Someone submitted a transaction, but no one's processing it. No one's mining, uh, running miners to do these things. So once I start up my miner, now he's ready to do some work. And now he says, oh, he's, he's starting to mine stuff. He's actually found some work to do. There we go. So now our transaction has been processed and it's gone through. Uh, we can see that because we've got a hash value. That's an, uh, a new entry on the blockchain. Uh, this is the block hash for it. And I've got a number. So this is block number 6026 since I fired this thing up this morning. Uh, this is how much gas I used to, to process it. So that took money, right? But I just it's funny money. I just made up. So I don't need to pay anybody for real. So 21,000 ways, not much. Don't get much for it. And then it says who it's from and who it's to. And I've got some logs here too, in case you need to track anything. You can actually put comments in there and it'll stay. Um, so that means it was all, everything's good. It was processed okay. So how did we do that? Let's look at this one. All right, so let's take a look at our project. So we've got a basic uh, Micronaut app here. And what I've done is I've got a controller and a service, very similar. I'm um, doing this in Groovy, but obviously you can do it in Kotlin or Java too. And so I just made a little funds controller here. And I've got my little get URL. I'm just saying transfer funds is, is my URL mapping um, to address and uh, the amount I'm sending in, in way. Um, this is the one I actually use here for the form because it's a post form, so I can make, you know, just annotate it with at post. It says what type of data I'm taking in um, and what parameters I'm looking for in the form. And so this one I'm actually, this is one I called with my form. So let's look into the service. 
So here we're calling send funds. So here we have to do some stuff. Uh, I've got a configuration key. Uh, you could make a configuration bundle if you'd like. But we need to, um, you know, whoever's controlling the money and sending it, in this case, it's kind of one, one, one person, always the same person to another person. So that's the kind of situation I've set up here in this example. So I need to tell it where to find that key store. So whenever I create that wallet um, and initialize the blockchain, I'm going to get one of these keys, and I need to point it there to use it. And I'm using Web3J as the library to do it. And I've got a password here, which is, you know, that's my default value. Doesn't matter since it's a private thing. So once we load all that up, uh, then we're ready to do something. So really, it's as simple as um, uh, calling this transfer uh, class, and then we can send funds. And then we just wait for that receipt. And that's what I showed you on the screen here is uh, going on. I'll talk about the contracts in a little bit. So I can do the same thing now with Grails. All right, so that's running now. There we go. Now let's send him some more money. Let's see if we received it. Oh, yeah, look. See, he's got five more Ether now. He's got 40 instead of 35 from our thing. So let's give him some more money. That was five billion way wasn't enough. So let's, let's get some more. Uh, cut and paste our... Oops. Our key. Who we're sending it to. Just add another zero. It's payday. And we go watch our miner here. Submit it. You can see the transaction's been submitted. It's waiting for the miner to do some work. All right. So money sent. So here we got some. Uh, we got the new hash of the blo on the blockchain. Came from here. Sent to the here. Now I should be able to go check. Oh, Scott, oh, he's got 90 now. All right, he's really raking in the jack. All right, so the Grails thing, uh, pretty similar. Got it almost set up identically uh, for Grails. We've got... Move this down. I've got the same type of thing going on here where I send funds, um, and I'm printing that out because just to make it look a little more readable. And then we go into our service. Got a lot of the same stuff. We got to initialize all the uh, things and load our credentials up, and then we can send funds. And this is doing the exact same thing with the same API. Uh, if we look in the build gradle here, oops. All right, we need to specify some stuff. Um, we need to specify whether we're using Java native types or something called um, um, Solidity. And then we can exclude contracts that don't, basically, this is like a, a blacklist, don't overwrite these. I've got some slides on that. Let's jump back to it. All right, let's talk about dApps. Didn't really talk about this a whole lot yet. So really, these are distributed applications, and they're really hard to describe exactly what makes a dApp a dApp. Uh, but it's all of the, it must, to be officially a dApp, it's gotta be one of all of these things. It needs to be open, it needs to be decentralized, it needs to pay some sort of incentive for handling it, and it's gotta be run by some sort of protocol or algorithm. So if it, meets, if it has all of these attributes, you technically could call it a dApp. Because there's so many dApps that do very different weird things. It's hard to see. Uh, so open source run, it must be, the code itself is distributed in the blockchain. So you're, it has to be open because anyone can see that code. So you're not supposed to put 
secret things in, <laughs> in a D app because everyone has a copy of it. So um, just because it might be encrypted weekly with something else doesn't mean someone else couldn't brute force it out of the application. And people have done silly things like this and uh, lost money or had their app messed with. It's got to be decentralized. You know, it must be uh, depend on some sort of distributed blockchain type of technology. It must pay some incentive, right? No one's going to be processing your transactions for free. Why would I give all my computing power away to everyone else on the internet just to process their transactions? I need to, I need to be making some money doing this, right? So that's when people talk about their mining. They're just basically lending their computing power to process all the transactions on the network in such, a, such tiny fractional amounts. Uh, unless you've got a pretty big setup, it's hard to really make any real money on it. Uh, it's got to be have some sort of encryption and protocol used. So it must issue tokens. It must have some sort of built-in consensus mechanism, right? So that means all the nodes have to agree that, you know, the chain is is what it says it is. And we got three different types of dApps. So there's a type one. Uh, that's when they have their own blockchain. And this is something like Bitcoin or altcoins. Uh, and there's a second type where the apps are sort of protocols and they need tokens to function. There's something called Omni protocols, an example of that. And then there's a type three, uh, and that's like a um, uh, safe network is an example of something like that where it uses coins to allocate file storage. So basically, uh, you're using coins to store files. Uh, some popular dApps here. Uh, one's called uh, ETHLANCE. It's a sort of a freelance site powered by a blockchain to find work to do blockchain work. <laughs> so it's kind of meta. Um, there's a, this is a, a cute one called Crypto Kitties. So you can basically pay to collect these little cats, and they're like limited time things. Um, so you can basically collect and breed these animals through the blockchain, sort of an experiment. So they have these exclusive ones they released, right? And then you got to pay with some currency. Uh, to get them. So this is actually something people like are really into. I'm not sure I would pay money for that, but uh, another one's called Aragon. So that's something you can do to manage manage decentralized uh, autonomous organizations. That's actually a type of thing called DAOs. Uh, there's one called Nasus. That's a prediction marketplace. Uh, so you can it's a distributed app that everyone's using their computing power to run it. Uh, another one, um, Asset Portfolio Market, is called Prism. There's another one called Raid, Radex. It's sort of an exchange for this ERC-20 token. It's sort of a standard format. We can talk a little bit about that later. And Golem, which is an Airbnb of sort of computing power. All right, so, the, if you, so, so I want to write a DSL, or I want to make a D app, right? What, I got to use some sort of DSL usually. Uh, otherwise, you'll just be writing it in bytecode. And there really isn't any kind of groovy DSL for doing these that, that's popular or anything like that. So the most common one is called Solidity. So we'll learn to work with that. Uh, there's another one called Truffle. There's another one called Viper, Pyramid Scheme, Flint, 4Ls, um, HA Assembly, Bamboo. Those are, these are all relatively popular ones, uh, probably starting with Solidity way at the front, though. So here's what Solidity looks like. So here's an uh, example that I we can deploy here in a little bit. And um, basically, there's an interface of a type mortal. And this is a greeter contract. And so we've got a uh, greeting. So when we deploy this, right, we're going to specify what the greeting is. Say, hello, great conf. And then we have a constructor uh, to start this thing up. Uh, we can do a new greeting, and then we you know, call some function that is part of the D app when it runs called greet. So it'll say, you know, hello, great conf. So there's different kinds of things in Solidity. So I'll talk about some of the syntax of how this stuff works. State values, they're variables that values are permanently stored in contract storage. So uh, this state variable here, which is um, at the top right here, this is permanently stored, right? Now, there's a way you can cheat that I can show you to update that, but for dApps, that's generally the case. Uh, you can also just declare anything at the top of the uh, script there. And uh, another thing that's interesting 
is you see this bit at the top here? You'd think people would have learned lessons from this, from the Java world of range versions. Uh, so that means I need to run a Solidity compiler greater than 4.0 but less than 0.6. And this is like a nightmare <laughs> a situation where well, I have this range of things. So what does that mean for you as a developer? That means you need to manage all these different installation versions of Solidity compiler. And they come out with like nightly builds of this thing. So it, depending how old the code is that you may have gotten your hands on, it might be a real bear to try to install this on your system. And I'll talk about some solutions to that. But there, I already looked. There's not an SDK man for uh, Solidity, which there really should be. To talk to Marco about that. See. Um, uh, functions, we can create functions here. Uh, they're just sort of the executable units of code, just like any other function would be in most other programming language. Uh, but the format, as you can see, is a little bit funky, right? It declares a function and the name and then the type. <laughs> and whether it's public or private is on the, on the wrong side, let's just say. And we can have function modifiers. It sort of amend uh, semantics of functions. So here's an example here. You can actually declare it as a modifier. Uh, and, you know, just require something to happen in this case. All right, and then we've got events. And these are sort of convenience interfaces. So if you're trying to debug one of these things, you can have some kind of way to log what's happening. So you can actually uh, put that in here, here. So you can say uh, emit and then something that would log some data or, or trigger some event to happen. And this is what the format looks at. And then we have structs. They're kind of uh, just sort of like an interface type of thing um, or not quite an enum, but um, just a di declaring a group of values. It's being a little bit different than just a class. Uh, they do have enum types, so you can actually declare an enum and, so for example, state, and then you could have different states of an enum. So that's nice. And we've got a lot more syntax that we could do, but that's just the basics, right? So here's the uh, link. Oh, when I send the slides out, you can get this too, but um, that's the reference of all the other things. All right, so Web3j, that's how we're making all of this fun stuff work. Thank goodness they have a decent plugin. Uh, they've got a Gradle plugin too. So really, uh, what happens is when we want to run one of these D apps, uh, this plugin is a wrapper for the Solidity compiler. And what it's going to do is it's going to take my um, Solidity code and then turn that into the byte code that it's going to run my D app. So it still requires you to have it lo installed locally. Uh, and I'll show you a thing here in a minute that what can help with that though. Um, so you specify where the generated files go, and you have to be really careful because this plugin will erase anything in that directory first. So if you put that in your where your regular source goes, uh, you might like lose all your source code. So especially if you haven't committed it yet, it could be devastating. So I'm not going to run it because I don't, don't want to screw my demo up. But um, show you what that looks like. So here we specify the package name for these generated classes, and then we uh, put this base directory here. So you want it somewhere in like your build directory, something like that, and then you want to copy that as a secondary Gradle task. To, if you want to copy that over back into your source tree, you can do that, but don't specify this path is in your source directory because it's going to blow it away every time you run this uh, compiler task. And you can also, this is where I was showing you earlier, uh, if I'd never wanted to touch certain contracts, then I can bla basically blacklist them here. So uh, don't ever generate this again and put it on there. Uh, sometimes you're in a situation where you have to modify one of these generated classes because that's the only way you can do something. And then so you don't, you, at that point you can't just regenerate it again. You get kind of in this yucky mess of, okay, I've got my old Java code that was generated. I can generate the new one and then I got to diff it and figure out what I need to move over. So we can look at one of these um, classes here. So here it drops this in here. Oops. So 
So here's a generated class, what it looks like. It's a little bit icky. And um, the compiler creates this like binary code of the whole thing in this giant string. And it shoves it in here. See all these crazy long things. Um, but you can modify this stuff if you need to. And that's how you can cheat and say I could modify that hello value of a uh, smart contract is I can actually add call calls in here and then try to alter it. But see, there's all kinds of stuff in here. So uh, that would be preferable to not modify this stuff. But you can't just either in make it an interface either because um, this base class has to be used. So it's not quite so easy to have this type of abilities. And mortal is this base thing it does, which is basically um, just really a base thing that Web3J uses to handle all this stuff, the remote calls. All right. All right, to install the plugin, all we need to do is add this to our build script uh, under the dependencies here and then apply the plugin, or you can do the plugin syntax, just specify it there. And here's our package name. We showed you that. Um, use J not of J Java types seems like something you would want to do, but everything that I've ever tried it on, it doesn't work right. So uh, don't mess with that unless you know what you're doing. All right, so we have this problem, right? Where how are we going to install 20, 100 different versions of the Solidity compiler on our machine? So they've made this uh, UI called Remix, and it's uh, a, a web IDE that will ha they someone's hosting this thing, and they have every version of the Solidity compiler you can choose from running, and I can pick it and then generate my c stuff from there. So let's check it out. Got it going here. So here we've got this web IDE. It kind of looks, it's, it's, it's basic, but it works. And it even remembers state. And so if I want to compile something here, I already did this. It, take, it was taking a while today, so I don't want to do it. But look, I can pick any version I want, right? So I've got this thing here that says, oh, I need greater than Solidity 0.42. So I can pick you know, whatever the last thing is that was a real release. These are all nightlies. So working to say I'm 4.2 exactly. Oh, so too old. Let's try 4.2.4. All right, so now we've got a compilation. And here's what the it spits out. And it gives it to you in 20 different formats for every little thing. But in the end, this bytecode here is really what you need. And you need this ABI data. And then everything else is helper things for different tools. Uh, function hashes, how much gas it would be estimated this might cost to use. Um, get some runtime bytecode things. So you definitely don't want to be doing all this by hand. You want to be using a compiler. It would be really cool if someone made a Groovy DSL that did this, but it's it's a lot of work to maintain this kind of thing. I think it's best to use whatever's out there. So this is what you use to manage the mess. This is the only thing that I found that isn't nightmarish. Otherwise, you're like installing local packages on your system and uh, uninstalling them and reinstalling different versions, and there's no good way to switch. So. Um, this seems to be what everyone uses to do that. All right, so got 11 minutes left. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Here's a bunch of links that are helpful for uh, learning about all this stuff and where I got all this information from. Any questions about ether, blockchain stuff? Yeah. yeah, let me run that real quick. So what we do is we want to deploy a contract, right? So I forgot to demo that. Apologies. I can do it in the Grails or Micronaut app. So Greeter is the name of the demo. So we, we have a, that's our contract. So let's deploy it, and we're going to call it... Uh, oops. Hello, great conf. I 
Wizard spell. Oh, this one's using Micronaut, yeah. And so what's happening here? We're going in our Ethereum service here, and we're deploying the contract. And so what happens is during this code generation from your Solidity, right, now you've got a, a Java class that you can reference called Greeter in this case. And so uh, I can deploy that Greeter with uh, all my credentials and things that I'd set up. And then I can set, uh, again, I can set my gas limit. Um, this is using a little bit older API. They're constantly changing. But uh, that's where we set our gas limit, right? So if it says, oh, if it costs too much to do, then maybe uh, we'll just wait. And we don't need to process it right now. It could be tomorrow. And then it'll just be held in the, in the blockchain until it happens. All right, so look at this here. Somebody got a new block They're running. So sort of things should have finished. All right, here's our contract. So it turned it into this bytecode. This is the whole thing, <laughs> what it sees in the blockchain network. So um, that's just a tiny little application embedded in there, right? And how much did it cost? Well, since I only have one miner, I guess the price is going up. It cost me, what was that, like 22 billion way. So I'm making money. So if you're deploying smart contracts to public blockchain, you, <laughs> you need to have money to do that. It computing power isn't free, and it's a market price based on uh, supply and demand. And that's why people run pri private blockchains, right? They, they want to use blockchain for some reason, and um, you're not going to want to pay just to run a little app. Uh, that would be silly. Um, we can. So generally that would be a contract for like tracking something, right? So uh, maybe you would have a contract that would, the most common example I've, I've heard people use is uh, say you want to assert, make an ass so someone makes an assertion, that's how you would use the contract. So but maybe they want to uh, do a something like the, this is the most common example I hear that would be a real world scenario is I want to buy fish at a restaurant, but 90% chance, at least in the US, that that's fake. Whatever the fish they say it is, it isn't. So um, doing something like a blockchain and having a smart contract, you could basically make an assertion all the way back through the chain to know it came off this fisherman's boat and it was indeed bluefin tuna or something like that. And uh, that would be uh, how you would make sure it's, it is what they say it is. So that's a most common world scenario. So when you want to make an assertion, that costs gas too, right? So this is how it powers and pays for itself, and I think keeps growing and growing. So the more people use it for all this stuff, the more incentive there is to mine, and then uh, more money to be made, and whatnot, just from doing that. So they've got people that are making these apps and doing transactions, and then there's people that are just trying to make money off processing the transactions. And that's where they get these giant server farms, and the, it's so fractional, right? The cost of electricity is a huge factor of whether it's even worth doing, or special hardware. And that's it. All right, you got a question? Yeah, you mentioned about Yeah, so... <laughs> There's a place, actually, I live in Texas, I'm, I'm from Austin, and uh, an outlying country area, there's a company from Taiwan that's just building a big data center because the electricity is really cheap out there to process uh, digital currencies, basically to just run miners. And uh, it used to be you could do mining with Bitcoin and all these other things if you had a high-end video card with a good GPU. Uh, I think that those days have passed because your cost of electricity at your own home, unless you're on some kind of solar setup or something, uh, will uh, not be worth it, right? And sometimes you can be a miner for these newer currencies and possibly make some money if you can exchange it out quickly enough to <laughs> before it evaporates. Um, 
And then it's completely unstable, right? You never know from one day to the next who's the top dog on that list and what the price is going to be on the currency when you want to translate it back into it. And you need really special hardware. A uh, problem we have in Texas is that the hardware generates heat. And so now if you've not, you don't have a system in your home to vent all of that stuff out, you're counteracting your electricity bill by then having to air condition <laughs> the place. It might work better if you have cheap electricity and it's like geothermal and it's in a cold place. That could be an optimal place you would want to run miners, right? So, something to take, think about anyway. And you need a whole lot of servers. All right, thanks everybody.